let's find out what the repercussions are of our actions last episode. I think we did well. I think we saved everyone. I don't think there's much damage to the ship, but I guess we'll see. Status report. The repair crew made it inside. EPS flow is back to nominal levels. The SIF is back up. How does this affect mission readiness, Mr. Ermat? Releasing the docking clamps using hull polarity minimized damage to the Resolute. We'll have some last-minute repairs to make, but if we reapportion some of the staff, we can make our departure on time. As of now, however, we are successfully moored to the station. Good to hear. Send updates to my ready room. Commander Rydek, with me. You disobeyed my orders. Well? It was the right decision. Respectfully, Captain. I made the right choice given the information I had- You disobeyed my orders! And not just in front of the bridge crew, but the Starbase staff as well. That's going to get around. My name's already tarnished around the fleet. But what is it going to do to my credibility on this ship? We saved lives, the dickhead. to the bottom. Bridge to lower decks. You didn't have the facts. Captain, I told you I'd be honest, so here it is. Maybe I shouldn't have disobeyed a direct order, but you were wrong. You weren't on board and you didn't have all the information, so I made the right decision for the ship. If you're worried about your credibility, put your ego aside and trust your crew. True. Trust me. You might have won some fans on the bridge with that stunt, but not everyone. Lieutenant Commander Chovak has already bent my ear. I'm sure he doesn't take it personally. He'll get over it in time. Mr. Chovak is more complicated than he would want to admit. I guess we all are. And, if I'm being honest, I'm not sure what I would have done in the moment either. You never really know if you weren't in those shoes. So, let's just boil it down to, you did what you had to. Thank you for understanding, sir. I'm sure no one knows the burden of command, as well as you do. I'm sure you will, someday. Despite it all, we got our final Starfleet clearance to depart. So if you'll fetch Mr. Ermot, we'll knock out the final details of any outstanding repairs, and then we'll set out for Hotari. Yes, sir. Sounds like a plan. Yeah, I'm not willing to risk, well, not in an instance like that, I'm not willing to risk crude lives. All departments reporting full mission readiness. We've got our full complement on board. This is my favorite moment, right now. The start of a new mission is always full of possibility. The Orion Syndicate could sell it as a drug. <laughs> Don't let the Admiralty hear you say that. Captain on the bridge. Sit. Sit, everyone. You all know, I'm not big on speeches. We're embarking on the first mission since our refit. Let's make it a good one. Disengage docking clamps. Docking clamps released. Thrusters ahead, Mr. Handar.
that should do it. Set a course for the Hotari system. Prepare to go to war paint. Aye, Captain. You know what? You take this one. Me? Yes, sir. Engage. Do you know what I'm looking forward to? I hope we get to negotiate with like alien races and stuff. That'd be awesome. If we can either choose to. But effective. We can choose to fight them or like break peace diplomacy. I think that's gonna be cool. I hope they implement that. Easy. Thank you. I'm fine. Really. I uh needs a meds, doesn't she? You don't look so good. I have to get to sickbay. Go. I think she's like her race's version of like a diabetic or something. Help me get her inside. I'm not being funny. Surely the technology is a bit more advanced to warn her far in advance that she. Or does she not just have like an automated dispenser on, in her suit or something? Come on now. We've got starships, well, but you can't dispense this. A, a few minutes more and it would have been one of the shortest tenures on record for a first officer. Is that the engineer that was out on the hull? That storm did a real number on him, but he'll live. Just needs rest. You should worry about yourself. Your deridium levels got dangerously low and destabilized your cell structure. This is definitely one of the more memorable first days I can think of. My name is Dr. Aram Duval, Chief Medical Officer. To be honest, I've never met a Kobliad before. You're rare, I know. I was going to say special. Your people's numbers have dwindled, despite the Federation's efforts to find a more readily available alternative to the deridium you need to survive. Yet you joined Starfleet, and manage to thrive. I imagine the responsibility must be overwhelming. Maybe even a burden at times. I know what it means. And I know the responsibility that comes with it. But I can't be anything more than who I am. And if someone has a problem with that or expects something else, then that's their problem, not mine. That's exactly right. And don't worry, I won't treat you like a science experiment. I just do the science and leave the experiments to Solano. You don't agree with his methods? I don't agree with his definition of acceptable risks. Not when the lives of your crew are at stake. My professional opinion is that the accident took a toll. More than he's willing to admit. He's overstressed, operating in the pressure cooker of his own mind. Which is never a good headspace when the lives of your crew are at stake. What concerns me is that now he's even further away from the thing he's been chasing his entire career. The breakthrough discovery. The major innovation. Something he can put his name on. But the more the time passes and the further out of reach it gets, the more risk he'll be willing to take. I hear you. But that's my job, isn't it? To make sure that doesn't happen. And we don't lose sight of the bigger picture. Which is exactly why I'm so glad you're here. We need you now more than ever. And I have to give you credit for what happened on the bridge. It took guts to defy a direct order. Huh. I guess word travels fast around here. It's a small ship. And everyone's curious about the new XO. Fortunately, your cell structure is almost completely stabilized. And I'll spare us both the lecture, but I do feel it's my responsibility to remind you, without regular infusions of deridium, you will not live. It's as simple as that. I wonder how integral the gameplay that's going to be. My work here is done. I think we have to. I bet you we end up sacrificing ourselves towards the end of the game. It's either take deridium or, or save the greater good or something like that. Lieutenant Bedrosian, I came to see if you were okay. We were all pretty worried on the bridge. No one knew what was happening. I'm feeling much better. 
Thank you. It's just part of who I am. You don't have to explain to me. I understand. I'm just glad you're okay. You trusted me earlier with the shields, and I appreciated that. I want you to know that I have your back. You did good Thank with that you. information. It worked well. Good call. Now, Carter, the emissions that gave you that burn are quite unusual, like everything else that goes with this storm. That's a combination of hyronolin and lectrazine to counter the radiation effects. That should help speed your healing. She's come by a couple of times to see you already. Yeah. Be brief. Doctor, drugs ain't gonna do shit. I need Good some to of that. See you awake again. Sexual healing. I was starting to get worried. Not that you aren't in good hands with Dr. Duvall. He How do I look, baby? Hell of a shot, though. So, be honest. How bad do I look? You look rugged. I told but... you, lads. Told you. Okay. How about heroic? Millie was looking in on you too, by the way. But since it's just us right now, I I had a chance to think about this while I was away. And I thought it was important that I just come out and tell you. Instead of tiptoeing around it. Worse, you like me. Come on. Leaving it unsaid. Let's not be coy. Yeah, this is just a guess, but you like me. Is that what this is? How'd you know? Must have been pretty obvious. Which is funny because it kinda came out of nowhere for me. At first. It wasn't hard to see. And you didn't exactly hide it. I wasn't exactly trying to hide it. But since it's that obvious, we've been really good friends for a long time. I want to see if there's more between us than yeah, just there is. friends. Let's do the damn thing. You don't have to explain it. I feel the same way. There is something between us. So. Do you want to find out what that something is? Bro, we're getting started on, a, on an excellent note here. For me. Absolutely. Why not give it a try? <laughs> Are you kidding me? I just said yes. <laughs> I wanted to be sure I heard that right. Sorry to interrupt, but uh, the patient needs to rest. No, no, no. He to get back to his old self. Of course. He needs to hop I'll on my Starship Enterprise. Soon. Yeah. Yeah. Told you, man. Chicks dig scars. Approaching the rendezvous point outside Atari space. Helm, bring us out of warp. Dropping to impulse. Ionic Asteroid field. Surging, Captain. Shield integrity holding. We can take it. We are the correct coordinates to meet the shuttle. Commander Rydeck, find us our diplomat, if you will. Aye, Captain. Let's reduce the noise. Filter out environmental signals. I can manually tune what's left for Federation signal types. I've located the shuttle. Opening comms. On screen. Shuttle to Resolute. Shuttle to Resolute. Debris field. Lost maneuvering. Losing. I can't get it any clearer. We won't get a transporter lock. It's just not happening. Power up the tractor beam. We'll pull them directly into the docking bay. Diaz, you good to run the tractor emitter? Yes, sir. Uh, you sure? I'm sure. Come on, Diaz. First thing, lock onto the shuttle and stabilize the rotation. We're 
pulling in debris. I'm on it. Come on, baby. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Get him out of the way. Nailed it. That's going to take out the shuttle. Diaz, the bridge. There's a large piece of debris headed for the shuttle. The tractor beam can't handle it. Can our shields take it? I believe so. Commander Ryder, plot an intercept course. On it. Right there. Here we go. Maneuvering thrusters bearing 53 Mark 17. 200 meters on an intercept course. Maneuvering. Working hard on the bridge. That's teamwork, son. Shuttlecraft on board. Good job. We're on our way down to meet them. Oh, that's Spock, so to speak. Ambassador Spock. The captain will be right down to meet you, sir. In that case, I will wait for him here. He's so weird, isn't he? <laughs> well, let me be the first to say welcome to the Resolute, Ambassador. Thank you, Petty Officer... Uh... Carter? Carter Diaz, sir. I am pleased to meet you, Petty Officer Carter Diaz. It appears I have you to thank for my safe arrival. Your assistance arrived not a moment too soon, if I may say so. You're very welcome, sir. I'm glad we could get you here in one piece. Indeed. We thought we were prepared for our arrival in Hotari space. But it is evident my craft was not sufficiently robust for such intense ionic activity. The storm has been pretty intense. There was an element that was most unusual. Before you came to our aid, our maneuvering thrusters and impulse engines were rendered inoperable. So we attempted a short traversal at warp speed, only to find that we could not achieve warp at all. Even though our diagnostics computer showed no faults or anomalies. What do you make of that? When all indications say that warp speed is possible, but in practice, we find it is not. I can't speculate, I'd have to have a look. I'd rather investigate than speculate. A sound principle. Take readings, run some additional diagnostic checks, and we'll get to the bottom of this. Quite logical, Petty Officer Diaz. Thank you. Ambassador Spock. Excuse me. I'm honored to have you aboard. I'd like to get right to it. We're already behind. Hey, this guy is gonna this guy's gonna have a great career ahead of him. As long as this radiation doesn't mess with his head, which I think it's doing. Oh, provocation to war. 
going to be with the Klingons, isn't it? I bet. It's always the Klingons. Like the Genghis Khan of the universe. Ambassador Spock, my senior staff. It's not every day that a captain gets to welcome a Starfleet legend aboard. Hmm. You flatter me, Captain Solano. But legend implies the past tense, whereas I am very much focused on our present circumstances. I didn't mean to suggest you were stuck in the past. You're right, Ambassador. Not the most diplomatic choice of words. Your experience comes from the past. But our present situation calls for it. True enough. We were hoping you could fill us in on the details. We got the basics from Starfleet. Two formerly peaceful neighbors are now on the brink of war. Indeed. And the tension between them grows fiercer by the hour. Olivia and Hotari. The Olivians are the more advanced species. They made first contact with the Hotari over a century ago. Mm. This is Tau, the Hotari moon. It is rich in dilithium, and for decades, the Hotari and the Olivians have shared a mining operation there. The Olivians provide the technological resources, while the Hotari have served as the labor force. The stability of that arrangement was the source of their peace until recently. The Hotari have suddenly and forcefully seized control of the mining operations and expelled the Olidians from their system. That is the official story, as told by the Hotari when they requested Federation mediation. But the details remain scant. Communications between all parties have been limited by the Ionic interference. How did it happen? How is it the Hotari were able to turn the tables and take the mines against superior forces, especially after decades in this arrangement? Unclear. The answer to that question may be the key to a new, lasting peace, and one that I hope we can uncover during these negotiations. But it is unlikely the relatively primitive Hotari forces would stand a chance against the Elidian fleet if this escalates to open war. Left unchecked, this conflict will result in more bloodshed, which is what we are here to prevent. And the dilithium trade hangs in the balance. Clearly the Hotari have been exploited in this relationship. Maybe we can persuade them peace is the more profitable alternative for everyone. They both profited from the mines. And for the Hotari, something is better than nothing. Peace is our objective after all. That It'd is still be exploited though. We can call it profitable or mutually beneficial, but at the end of the day, the Hotari are still being exploited for their own resources. True peace is not merely the absence of war. And as such, this conflict will surely come again. Neither the Elidians or the Hotari are members of the Federation, so we can't make them do anything. There is an additional complicating factor I should mention. In the past, the Federation has relied on the Elidians as a source of dilithium. That certainly changes things. The Federation sources its dilithium from a lot of places. Yeah. We're not going to be trusted then, are we? That is true. That means the Hotari have no reason to trust us. I wouldn't go that far, Commander. We are completely neutral in this matter, on neither one side nor the other. We're not, though. Any suggestion otherwise would compromise our position. Given the Federation's involvement in the Illidium dilithium trade, Captain Salama and I must make every effort to appear neutral in these negotiations. What worries me is if this whole thing unravels and we're at the mercy of the storm at less than full strength. We can't let it come to that. Considering what the Ion Storm has done to our ship and the Ambassador's shuttle, we have to assume the Elidian fleet has had problems with it as well. This recent surge in the energy disturbance temporarily levels the playing field. Commander Westbrook is correct. The energy anomalies around the Hotari systems have been noted in the past. If it's keeping the two sides talking instead of shooting at each other, 
That actually helps us negotiate a peace. And we'll take advantage of that as long as it works in our favor. And when it doesn't? All the more reason to learn as much about it as we can while we are here. We do not want to be caught unprepared, should the energy anomaly continue to fluctuate. So I trust we understand our circumstances. We're operating on a strict timetable here, and we're going to be leaving for the negotiations shortly. Commander Westbrook, I want you to leverage our systems to investigate the anomaly from here while we're gone. Hi, Captain. Thank you all. Dismissed. I want to speak to both of you privately. Ambassador Spock, I'd like to make a formal introduction. My first officer, Commander Jara Rydek. Commander, as you are aware, there are limits to what Captain Solano and I can do in our official capacity as representatives of the Federation. But someone in an unofficial capacity, your first officer, for example, would not be bound by those restrictions. Commander Ryder could ingratiate herself to certain parties behind the scenes, where they may be more candid in revealing information that could lead to a resolution. A spy. <laughs> she certainly... Or a diplomat, or whatever you... Whatever... It helps in this case. It whatever be sounds best. But I'm not opposed to it. Whatever it takes. I'm perfectly happy to work outside the lines. And by extension, you will be doing your duty, Commander. Just not too far outside the lines. Well, I hope Commander Rydek will have more luck finding out what really happened than we will through official diplomatic channels. The fate of the negotiations, the interests of the Federation, and the prospect for peace may very well depend on it. Oh, this is going to be good. Lads, I am a master diplomat. I solve things with brute force. Mr. Diaz, I understand you have already discussed the warp drive failure with Ambassador Spock? I have. It is imperative that the Ambassador's shuttle be flight ready. I need you both to ascertain the root cause of the system failures he encountered. I'm surprised, Commander. I thought you would have wanted to work on Ambassador Spock's shuttle yourself. I respect the Ambassador and his many accomplishments, but I do not derive any satisfaction from interacting with his shuttle as if it were somehow transubstantiated through its association with him. True, that Especially is hilarious. I have the entirety of this starship to concern myself with. I am not the chief engineer of this shuttlecraft. When you look at it logically, yes, it is just a shuttle. No different than any of the others. There is plenty that is different about it, and that is what you are to investigate. But please limit your findings to observable scientific phenomena. We'll try to restrain ourselves. Then I will leave you to it. Make note of any abnormalities in your report. Carry on. <laughs> it seems like he's warming up to us. I don't know about that. Even Chovok has to look at that face and know you've earned some real respect. And I have to admit that I owe you one. You were right to make me go first. I don't know what I was thinking. You've pulled me out of trouble how many times? Call it even. Okay. At the very least, maybe I can track down that bottle of Saurian brandy you're still on the hook for. Yeah. But first, we have work to do. Come on then, baby. Let's get to work. Ready to go? All set. Let's run the diagnostic. <laughs> Look, this is this is what my lass is gonna get the night. <laughs> my lass in the game. What she called the one that we've just got in a relationship with. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I know about your talk with Miranda. You, you do? Miranda, she's she called. She sent me a Priority One dispatch right after your conversation. I'm happy for you. Both of you. 
Thank you. Thanks. But I'm only going to tell you this once. Don't screw this up. Because I would be very unhappy if you tried this out and then, I don't know, six weeks or six days later, I have to start splitting holidays between the two of you. All because things went south and you're not on speaking terms. That just isn't going to work for me. Have some faith. And I Things know do. you'll respect that. I'm just going to pause it there. Things do, right? Now that she said that, I honestly think we're going to, sometime in this game, get to have some smoking hot alien woman hit on us and we're going to have to choose it's going to be a choice between our head and our penis and i can't say what's going to happen <laughs> i can't make that call just yet baby you really don't believe in me huh it's not you or her just running the numbers and things don't work out more often than they do I like we can my make it if we and try. I like our group. I don't want to lose that. And the famous words of Bon Jovi. Is that thing done yet? Yeah, yeah it's wrapping up. Let's see. The relays along the primary EPS are blown. But the backup relays are all intact. An EPS overload from the warp drive could cause that. But how did the shuttle end up dead in the water? Huh. Well, maybe the ship's data recorder can tell us something. Yes. Oh, man. This is the best. This is the best mouse cursor in a game I've ever experienced. Two finger drummer. Here. They were only about eight minutes from their plotted warp point. No faults, just those warnings. What are they? There was a complete warp cascade failure. Wow. They're lucky the shuttle didn't turn inside out. Makes me think the computer panicked on the warp field equation. The warp field became inverted suddenly. I've seen this happen when the center warp coil cracks. A cracked warp coil throws a fault code. Still, we should take a look. Subspace variance out of tolerance. What does that mean? It means the main navigation array lost sight of space somehow. Hmm. Will the array going offline cause that? Yes, but it should have also thrown a fault code. Any one of these failures should have thrown a fault. If it was caused by a system failure. None of this caused the relays to blow. Roll forward to when that happened. Yes, ma'am. So here, they take a moment to get their bearings and they attempt to re-engage the warp drive. There. That's the relays blowing. And look, there's another warp system alert. They're all the same. Subspace variants out of tolerance or warp inversions. Finally, there's a complete warp cascade failure. Then it's one of two things. Either a warp coil is cracked or the navigation array is offline. That makes sense. Divide and conquer. You want to check the warp coils or the navigation array? I'll check the other. I'll go for the Not warp coils. This. One of these systems is likely broken. I'll check the nacelles for a cracked coil. Seems a lot easier to pinpoint. We'll go for this one. Your tricorder can record and analyze data. Looking through it will reveal the unseen. Use X to equip or holster it. Hold right trigger to scan glowing objects. You must be close to some objects to scan them. Deep scan. Some objects you can scan will activate a deep scan. During a deep scan, use left bump and right bump to switch between different scan modes and search for glowing objects. The mode indicators in the tricorder will blink if there is an object to find in that mode. When you have scanned all objects in the frame, will change colour or left trigger to analyse. Right, not gonna lie. The leading coil shows evidence of routine maintenance or re to repair micro abrasion from neutrino interactions. 
Center coils guide the warp field through its focal event, maintaining a culminated thrust vector. No fractures detected. In their standby state, warp coils produce a residual electromagnetic field. No deviations detected. So it's okay. I checked every coil on the port and cell for imbalances. If any coil in either engine were cracked, I would have detected it. So it must be the navigation array. You have to check it first. Except you can't just make that deduction. Not. Checked and double checked. Well, the readings don't lie. Here comes the security detail for the way team. Hey. I'm not here. <laughs> We're escorting the negotiating team to the surface as soon as they come down from the bridge. I don't want to interrupt some important work. I was just hoping to see you before I go. The captain and the others will be here any minute now. Should be an interesting ride down to the surface. Come on, I'm never too busy to make time for you. That's not true. I did, I, that was a blatant lie. But I am glad you came by. No, that's more accurate. <laughs> I gotta be precise with you, huh? Hey, Maris. Yeah, that's the thing, though. Like, like when you say that, it, it, whenever someone says, "I've always got time for you," it's a fact that it doesn't. It doesn't mean that one hundred percent. It means for most of the time, I've got time for you. But obviously, there's certain situations like life or death. Where you simply can't just chat. These those button pushers you're always hanging out with? And you're the phaser jockeys we always beat in Parisi squares, right? All aboard for Hotari. That another one of the captain's railroad things? <laughs> Gotta be. I just usually zone out by the time he gets to the whole uh, steam engines were the warp drives of their day part. Catch y'all later. You don't want to miss your train. Go on, lay one on me, baby. Go. Not gonna lie, I'd rather not leave right now. Yeah. Feel the connection through physical touch. That was nice. Yeah, it was. Save some of that for when I get back. I'll save more than that, baby. That deal. <laughs> Bro, why is this game so good? <laughs> That's just like... Be seeing you. Lads, uh, what, I, what I really enjoy, which is, it, it's just funny, is like in games, I love it when you can like have a relationship with someone. I just find it, I find it hilarious. I find it amazing. It's Lara Diaz. If you could float back down to reality, we still have a ways to go. All right, all right. All right, where were we? So the warp coils in the navigation array are fine, but the nav computer doesn't seem to think so. I'm out of ideas short of field stripping the shuttle from bow to stern. You want to take this out of the shuttle and throw it on the bench? Oh, real hands on maintenance. I like it. Bro, why is everyone <laughs> flirting with me? It's I've got this okay, mad the nav score. computer is patched into the ship. The ship's computer can double check our work. If the shuttle's nav computer is putting out false data, well, no. Let's run through the shuttle's logs again. Running now. Same. Warp field inversion and a cascade failure. However, the Resolute computer doesn't show the same subspace variance. We're in the same conditions that the shuttle was in when it failed. Why wouldn't the ship's computer get a matching result? What if the subspace variance was a momentary occurrence? That's a possibility, and it would explain why the simulation under our current sensor readings failed to reproduce the issue. But a subspace anomaly strong enough to cause a warp field collapse would leave graviton ripples for days. Let's run with the momentary subspace variance theory for now. Roll forward to the shuttle's attempt to re-engage the warp drive. We need the conditions of space around the shuttle at the moment of warp failure. Resuming simulation. Yeah, when they first mentioned it, I thought it was like, was, is it some sort of black hole that they entered and like reappeared out of? Obviously not a black hole, like something that's similar that could cause you to like... 
go in and out of something and travel great distance in a short period of time. And that's why the systems couldn't grasp what was happening to them. Error in warp field calculation. Cochrane formula variables are out of range. That right there. Take the shuttle sensor data from that moment. Computer, why did the warp field calculation fail? Warp field pressure return non-orthogonal. Results are undefined. That doesn't help. Wait, what if we use a different ship? Put the Resolute into the simulation instead of the shuttle. Yeah, it should warp just fine. Unless... Computer, run the simulation with the Resolute. Resolute simulated. Computer, give me manual control on the warp power. Static field intensity, warp 1.1. 1.2 1.3 Warp pressure is destabilizing Error in warp field calculation The warp drive has experienced a system-wide cascade failure Warp field collapsed Subspace variance is out of tolerance Cochrane formula results are undefined That had nothing to do with the shuttle what -o? The same moment when the shuttle failed to warp, so did the ship Whatever happened to the shuttle just happened to us the Resolute will not sustain warp. We can't leave Hotari space. Oh shit, so we're also trapped here. Ah, that's what's going to be the problem. That's how they possibly might win in the... You no, know, the conflict between the, the effective slaves and the... The other... What they're called, the Hotari. I don't know what they're, they're, I don't know what they I don't think we can find out either. No. Yeah, I don't know what the two alien species are called, but let's just say the slaves and the, the masters. Obviously the slaves have had an uprising. Maybe the slaves have found a way to stop shuttles warping in and out, which means they will have the upper hand against the masters because they won't be able to get their fleet in or out of range. Interesting. That's what I think they've done. That's that's maybe the the ace in the hole. Ambassador Spock, Captain Solano, welcome to Hotari. We are honored you have come. My name is Tylus Altaris, Minister of Diplomatic Affairs. The honor is ours, and this is Commander Jara Rydek, first officer aboard the USS Resolute. You'll find she has a keen mind. I think the Hatari are the slaves, I think. And unique insight into the dynamics between the Hotari and the Lydians. Lydians are the... to be here as representatives of the Federation. I'm so glad... These you... must be the representatives of the mighty Federation, the reigning authority in the galaxy. Or so we've been led to believe. Whether that's true or not remains to be seen. But, either way, we're grateful you've made the time to come to our little corner of the universe. And you are? This is Galvin, and this is Citron, the heroes of the revolt in the mines. Let's hope this is the last time we ever have to come here. If you'll excuse me. They have sent the worst diplomats. Who walks in with a face like that? I think we're about to begin. They want one thing and one thing only, and it's, it's not a peaceful resolution. Did you hear the arrogance from that guy? I don't know what we're walking into here. But that guy was something. That may be true. But let's keep an open mind going into the negotiations. Exactly. Hopefully he's just one voice amongst many. Then let's That's hope right. he's the outlier. The Hotari have invited us as their guests, so we must show them the proper respect. Yeah, that, that's a mistake that many people do make. Like, if you have one bad interaction with a group of people, you can't hold that against a group of people. Like that guy might just be an arrogant dick, but you can't hold that against the whole Hotari while you're trying to have negotiations, you know what I mean?
we're gonna get to choose a bow. Show de I don't know what deference means. Show strength. Show deference. Yeah, that's what, that's what we need. We can't be seen to speak too assertive. Ambassador Spock, welcome to Holtari Prime. The honor is mine, your majesty. That the Federation would send one of their most respected representatives is not only an honor to the Hotari people and their queen, but a recognition of our stature and importance. Let's get on with it, shall we? With all due respect to the Federation and their ambassador, they have no authority here. We are not members of their alliance. We are not subject to their rule, nor yours. We oh, demand the immediate return of all mining operations to Elidian control, as it has been for centuries and will be for centuries more. That has always been our understanding. That understanding has changed. Then you invite war. And if you cannot remain silent, you will be silenced. But his point is well taken. What is the Federation's interest in this matter? Perhaps you would have us trade one oppressor for another? The Federation remains neutral. Our only interest is the peaceful resolution of this conflict. We are here at your request, Your Majesty. For now. I'm trying to keep an open mind here, but it's not easy. I thought they wanted us here. Was there something you wanted to say, Captain? Oh, no. My apologies. And what about the Cobliard? She's not part She can of speak for herself, can she? Then let her. <laughs> now then, what is your name? Commander Jara Rydek, Your Majesty. Being a Kobliard, you would know better than anyone. Your people suffered brutal treatment at the hands of the Cardassians. Their injustice towards the Kobliard is as unimaginable as it is unforgivable. Not unlike how we have been treated by the Alidians. As much as they'd have you believe they are the victims here, remember it was the Hotari who attacked us. Hundreds of innocent Alidians were slaughtered without mercy in those mines. The blood is on their hands, not ours. Quiet! I don't really feel that's a valid argument, to be fair. If after all the Cobliard suffered, you finally had the chance to right that wrong, to get out from under their control, would you take it? Or would you negotiate a peace? I would seek, I would seek peace. There is no remedy for what the Kobliad suffered. And I fear who we might have become in pursuit of it. There is no justice if the oppressed become the oppressor. So I would willingly accept a peaceful resolution if it were offered. That is the real opportunity. Perhaps, Commander Rydak. Perhaps. Unfortunately, that was not the case, was it? No, it was not. Peace is often elusive to those who need it most. The Federation is the most powerful, most advanced alliance in the galaxy. It's widely known we have an abundance of dilithium in our mines. And it's in your interest to secure a steady supply. Your Majesty, if I may. Ambassador Spock would have us believe you're here as a neutral party in the interest of peace. So why are you really here? I want the truth, not your Federation rhetoric. Dilithium is a factor. 
It's possible the Federation has an interest in both peace and securing a steady source of dilithium. One does not preclude or prevent the other. But that's just my personal opinion. Given the Federation has done business with the Elidians for decades, I would agree. It's entirely possible, if not highly likely. What they haven't said, but cannot deny, is a simple truth. The dilithium trade would not and will no longer exist without a Lydian involvement. We created it for the benefit of everyone, especially the Hotari. We've given them warp technology. We've let them share in the profits. We've made their lives infinitely better than before dilithium was discovered. All of that goes away if the Federation turns a blind eye to their treachery. That is enough of your lies! The Hotari are quite capable of running the mines. We've done so for centuries. So tell me, who deserves control of the dilithium trade and the mines on town? Who should the Federation recognize? The Hotari or the Alidian? Only be one or the other, not both. The Hotari. If I have to choose only one, then it would have to be the Hotari. Well said. How could the just and wise Federation make any other choice? <gasps> this is an outrage. The Federation has lost all credibility. The mines are ours. Lydia will not be deterred. We will take back our mines by any means necessary. Then you will see more blood spilled. I am more than willing to address your concerns, Your Majesty. Yours as well, Representative. But I suggest we could have a more productive conversation with a smaller group. Perhaps only the most essential representatives. I suppose there is some sense to that. There is. I hope we meet again, Jara Rider. Yeah, the thing is though, right, we obviously we do we haven't got the full picture of what's actually going on. It depends if these guys are actually slaves in the mines, which I think the game's hinting at. But if these people are actually working in the mines and profiting from it, then it's a different story. There there's no reason why they should have attacked and killed everyone, especially if they weren't a military force and they were just like innocent civilians also working us alongside the, the Hatori. But we don't know. But essentially if I said what I do think is if it was if you had the ability to go to different planets and stuff and there was a certain alien species on that planet that is their planet you know what I mean you you if you take that over by military force and expect a pushback it might not be straight away it might not be for decades it might not be for millennia but there will be a pushback unless there's some sort of mutually reward Mutual reward for both parties, which I don't think there is here, or it's a disproportionate amount. These Lydians seem like pricks. Everything on the diplomatic front. You make nice with the locals and see if you can get some answers. We need to find out why the Hotari are so willing to risk war. What happened in those mines? That's that's the information we need. I need to know exactly what's going on in the mines. Right, this is good. Oh, what a fountain. Hmm. Soothing. The Death Star. That must be Tau. The place it all started. 
Such rough terrain. No wonder the Hotari are so tough. An Elidian warship, the Zeldi. They must want the Hotari to know they can use it at any time. Yeah. But why haven't they? That's what I want to know. Yeah, that, they've put that there as a, a form of intimidation. Commander, I'm glad you've chosen to side with the Hotari. I knew the Federation would see through the Elidians' baseless claims. I mean, not on either side. the interests of my people. To be clear, I'm not on either side of this conflict. Our only interest is peace. Hmm. I will keep that in mind. I assume you were there the day the mines were seized from the Elidians. Not seized. Reclaimed. And restored to their rightful owners. Yes, I was there. We had to be decisive. Before the Elidians could even realize their worst nightmares upon them. Were the Hotari miners armed during the revolt? I'm just trying to understand how it happened. If by that you mean armed with centuries of abuse and exploitation at the hands of the Elidians, then yes. Which doesn't really answer my question. <laughs> we had them vastly overwhelmed from the start. They respect one thing above all else, and that is force. The greater the force, the more certain the outcome. I agree with that. Any talk of making peace is just that, and worth little without the strength to secure it. Which makes me wonder about your ship, the Resolute. Undoubtedly the Federation's finest warship. Ready to contend with anything the Elidians might have in store. Or is that not true? Maybe I've misjudged it. I wouldn't say state-of-the-art, but the Resolute is plenty capable and can hold its own against just about anything. Let's hope so. Because at the moment, it's the only thing preventing them from wiping us off the map. Yeah, it is true what he's saying. General. Peace. I truly believe that peace is only possible. If there is fear of force, that makes sense. Like peaceful nations have to have a strong force that's willing to fight for peace. If you don't have, if you aren't strong enough to fight for peace, you'll never have it. A pleasure meeting you, Commander. I'm sure we'll cross paths again. Do we learn fuck all from that conversation? Right, let's speak to these guys. Oh, who are these? Tylus. Commander Rydeck, I'm encouraged to see the Federation supporting my people. I'm afraid of what might happen without your help. I'm glad to hear it. I just hope you're not the only one who feels that way. I apologize for that. These are unusual times, to say the least. Much is changing. I saw you speaking with Sidron. Our national hero. I'm curious, what did he say? He seems to be of the opinion that negotiating for peace is a waste of time. Because force is the only blunt instrument he understands. He's a miner, not a diplomat. For the first time in our history, the Hotari have the upper hand. We see ourselves as strong instead of downtrodden. New voices have risen up. Old voices shouted down. Galvin and Sidron have become national heroes. Now, they have the Queen's ear. For better or worse, depending on your perspective. I assume they've taken your place. I was one of the Queen's most trusted advisors. And I hope to prove myself worthy of being so again. Which is why you're here. My fear has been that the Elidians will launch an attack and crush us. You've seen their starship, no doubt. They could have retaken the mines whenever they wanted to, but it never happened. 
And as strange as this may sound, I'd almost say they're afraid. I just don't know what they're afraid of. It's still mm. the same bluster and bravado you would expect from them. But it has Federation, no maybe. Like they're afraid of what might happen. Was it for fear of the repercussions? Once the Federation became part of the equation? Possibly. I, I almost want to say this was from the very start. Before engaging the Federation was even on the table. Since the day of the revolt, Galvin has seized control of the mines and restricted all access. No one's allowed without his personal authorization. And they've taken over a section of the palace with just as much secrecy and security. Shit, I know what's happened. I'm told it could be something they brought back from the mines. It is. They've found they some sort of technology. Everyone pretends it doesn't exist. I strongly suspect they're hiding something. What do you think it is? I've heard rumors it's some sort of ancient artifact, but I haven't seen it myself. How can we know? I'd better see what's happening. Shit, Do you of think course. You can find out what they're hiding. I need to see proof of something before I can make my case to the Federation. I can try, but even if I found it, I might not know what to make of it. Take this. You can use it to capture whatever you find, and then send it to me. Thank you. I will let you know what I find. And I look forward to our meeting again. Interesting. This changes things. I'll tell you why. Sorry. I couldn't help but notice you were speaking with the Hotari this whole time. I figured in the interest of fairness, I should offer another perspective. Of course. I'm probably not telling you anything you don't already know, but these negotiations rely on the Federation's neutrality, as does any hope you might have for a supply of dilithium in the future. So why you would choose to side with the Hotari escapes me. That's what I'm doing, remaining neutral. Without a Lydian involvement, there is no dilithium trade. We are and will remain completely neutral. Our only interest is the peaceful resolution to this conflict. As is ours. Of course, the question is, at what price? A major solid, Arminta. Special Attaché, Elidian Armed Forces. Pleasure to meet you, Commander. I have my issues with the Hotari. But I have to give them some credit. They know how to seize an opportunity. Inciting an uprising the same day as a massive once-in-a-lifetime ion storm. Our assumption was that this storm was just an anomaly. Yes, a very convenient anomaly. At least, that was what we were told. Of course, I wasn't there. But who am I to say otherwise? Something tells me there's more to the story. So what really happened? Well, the official story is that it was the storm that enabled the revolt. How else do a bunch of unarmed, unorganized miners seize control of an entire moon, much less thousands of mines? But I've talked to people who were there. They tell a different story. They say they're lucky to have escaped with their lives. That it was more than just the storm. That somehow, the miners were able to harness the energy from the storm. I know it sounds crazy. I'm not even sure I believe it myself. But that's what they said. You just answered your own question. How do a group of miners do something that in theory can't be done? That's how. Harnessing the storm. But, even if it's true, how does that even happen? You tell me. Yeah, okay. We're getting to the bottom of this. If you'll excuse me, Commander Ryder. Right, so. A couple of things before we end the episode, because we'll, we'll call it an episode there. I don't believe in true neutrality. I don't believe anyone or anything, well, sorry, anything. Any, any living thing is truly neutral. Nothing is. There's always going to be a part of you 
that wants to fight for something that's in your best interests. While you can try and mitigate the damaging factors to other parties, you still want it to be beneficial for you. And at best, in a best situation, mutually beneficial for everyone involved. But I do not believe in true neutrality. I don't believe it exists. Secondly, so what I think's happened is this artifact's been found. They've realized they can from from additional information, they can harness the power of the storm, use it as some sort of weaponry, which is why they're not scared of this this the Illidian Starfleet, because they can shoot it out of the sky with lightning. Or with an ion storm. Hang on, what else was I going to say? Yeah, and this is another thing. So, although we are going to try and go into this and argue for neutrality and get a peaceful solution, I don't think it would be wise or in our best interests as the Federation to allow the... I forgot the name of the, the creatures, the Hidians. The, the... No, the big rock creatures. The, the dumb ones. The ones that were slaves. It's not in our best interest to leave them with this artifact. Because people who do it, people who have never experienced power before or have never experienced a slow rise to power will often abuse it. But as you can see, these guys, these guys in the minds of miners, they've got their first taste of true power. And I feel like they're gonna go, they're gonna start a war with it. They don't know how to control it. They think that right, we've got this power, we can destroy everything. It's the wrong way to do it. And that's where I feel this is going. In my negotiations, I've got the choice. I'm going to remove the power from these guys. But then again, that will also be seen that this is working in the Federation's best interest. And yes, of course it is. Because as the Federation, we are trying to go for neutrality. But I believe in the... If you look down to the fundamentals of the Federation... When you get something as big as that, it slowly but surely becomes a massive grab for power. Which will allow you to be a stealth dictatorship. That's what the Federation is. It'll be, they'll have some sort of ruse that, oh yes, we're, we're having everybody in peace. That's only because they're going to hold the majority of power. And that's to be fair, I think peace comes from that. I think if you want, let's just say global peace on a globe, the best way to have global peace would be to have the world as one with the person at the top that holds the most power have good intentions, truly. But that doesn't always that doesn't always relate. Two good intentions. Just because someone has good intentions doesn't mean that it's going to be a thing. Yeah, I love shit like this because there's no right or wrong answer. But I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to try and take the relic from these guys and negotiate peace between them. And that means we'll retain the power. Okay, lads. Hope you enjoyed the episode. See you in the next one.